Welcome to Coast the Coast. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Lily Weinberg. I'm here joined by my colleague Lillian Corral. We are both program directors of the Community and National Initiatives at Knight Foundation, and we are thrilled to have you join us. Lillian, I'm going to kick it off to you. Um, if you can tell us a little bit about what we are doing with Coast to Coast. Hi, Lily. Uh, well, as you know, Knight's mission is to foster more informed and engaged communities because we feel that they're essential to a healthy democracy. And our national strategy focuses on two areas, public spaces and the role of technology and communities. So Coast to Coast is going to be a weekly show that's going to take a deep dive into cities and explore all of the ideas and insights that are emerging, especially during this time of rapid change. I'm, I'm really excited to be partnering with you on this, Lillian, and um, we have a few things in common. We are both on um, the coast, right? Opposite coast, <laughs> uh, Miami to LA. Um, we'll be covering everything in between, um, and we love cities, um, and there's a lot to talk about in this dynamic time. And on top of that, we are quarantined with a toddler. Um, yeah. <laughs> so what can go wrong, right? <laughs> um, but I'm really excited um, to be uh, co-hosting this with you and um, let's just dive right in. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. So, so Eric, uh, we, Eric Feinenberg is our first guest and we are thrilled to have you, Eric. So I'm going to take a second to introduce Eric and we'll dive right in. Um, so Eric is professor of sociology and the director of the Institute of Public Knowledge at NYU. Um, he served as a research director of Rebuild by Design after the Superstorm Sandy. Um, he has many books, but most recently, Palaces for the People, a book about the essential role of social infrastructure, like libraries, playgrounds, and parks, which many of you in the audience, um, you know, lead a, a work around public space. Um, and he's really looking at that at, re at revitalizing civic life. Um, I'm really excited, Eric, because you're going to be launching a new series, The Shift, um, looking at the shifts in public life during COVID-19. Um, Tonight is our the first episode of The Shift at 5 p.m. Eastern, and you guys will be doing a deep dive on public space. So hopefully this will um, whet your appetite for that. Um, last but not least, he is the inaugural Night Public Spaces Fellow, and we're thrilled to have you, Eric. So welcome. Great. It's, th it's great to be here. Thank you for doing this. Um, I just, I'm just really happy to have another excuse to be on Zoom today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my favorite public space. Uh, you, you just can't believe how much time I'm spending on Zoom. It's the it's the place to be. I know it's 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 pretty crazy, and and um, I know people are going to be asking about the wallpaper and your and your and your back. <laughs> Let's get it out there, so, right? Away. So we'll get it out there. And yeah. so for anybody, you um, you can put your your questions in the Q and A box, um, and then we also will be streaming live on Facebook. Um, hashtag night live. And so Eric, the way that we're going to structure this, this is going to be short and sweet. We, we have about 30 minutes together. Um, for the first 15, it's going to be a conversation between you and me. Um, I have a few questions to ask you. It's going to go by really quickly. Um, and, and for the audience, um, we really encourage you to ask questions. My co-host Lillian Corral um, will be looking at those questions um, on Facebook Live and then also on, um, on you know, in the Q&A function. And and, and she'll be elevating those themes. Um, so she'll be jumping in and asking you those questions and then we'll, we will, we'll close it. So um, let's just dive right in, Eric. Okay. okay, let's do it. So, so first, um, you know, there's a lot that we can, we can talk about because you are so uniquely um, situated to, to discuss pandemics with your background and, and studying um, living alone and um, crises and disasters and, and of course social infrastructure. For this conversation, we're really gonna go in deeper into place and how you know that's a driver of, of social connections. So first, if you could start with um, defining for our audience, what does social infrastructure mean? And, and why does it matter for crises? Why does it matter for a pandemic? Yeah, so I use this concept social infrastructure in Palaces for the People, the book that, that came out uh, about a year and a half ago. And it's a concept we don't use very often in the United States. It, it has had a little bit more traction in Europe. Um, the way I use it is specific though and, and different. And so when I say social infrastructure, I'm referring to the physical places, which could include organizations as places uh, that, mm -hmm. that shape our interactions. 
And the argument I make in, in, in the book is that when we invest in social infrastructure, when we design it well, when we maintain it well, especially when we program it, uh, we have tremendous capacity to uh, improve the likelihood or increase the likelihood that, that people will engage one another you know, in, in real time. So think of the playground, for instance. Think of what, what it means to live in a neighborhood that's got a playground. If you're a parent, if you're a child, you're just so much more likely to have a, a shared gathering place mm -hmm. from which all kinds of relationships and, and possibly even eventually community can develop. Whereas if you live in a neighborhood that doesn't have a, a playground, or like I grew up in Chicago in the 1970s and 80s, we had some playgrounds because the city had invested a lot in public space, but then the city stopped spending money on maintaining them and they became problem areas and people avoided them. So mm -hmm. if, you, if you live in a context like that, you're just much less likely to engage one another. And how that affects us in daily life is it makes it more or less likely that we will be in a place that develops social support networks and something that feels like cohesion. If, it, if there's a crisis, that can make a big difference. So the first book I wrote is a book about a heat wave in Chicago in 1995 that killed hundreds of people. And people were much more likely to, uh, to die in their apartments if they lived in a neighborhood that had a, a really weak social infrastructure. They mm -hmm. just didn't have the same connected tissue uh, that, that, that allowed for support. Now, this pandemic situation we're in is really different because obviously you don't want your neighbors coming into your apartment right now to take care of you. The, the way that we're supposed to stay safe is by physically distancing, right? right. And I, I, I say physical distancing, not social distancing, because I actually think social distancing is kind of a dangerous concept. We, we actually need social support. So the, the question of the moment is, is it possible that the neighborhoods that built up strong solidarity, a strong sense of cohesion that had a robust social infrastructure before this have been able to maintain more virtual connections or, or continue to do things like provide food delivery service to older people uh, or to sick people or to make sure that they get care. Are, are those protective bonds still working in the same way? That's an open question we're gonna have to explore uh, you know, when it's safe to do that. And you'll be looking into that, I would assume, right? Uh, very, very much, we're, you know, we're already starting. I, I teach it at New York University. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a social scientist and we're already starting a bunch of projects where we're, we're, we're trying to understand uh, a bunch of different comparisons, you know, so the world has been talking about, you know, why South Korea uh, and, and you know, has, why has South Korea done so well and the United States mm -hmm. done so badly, or, you know, why has San Francisco done so well in New York City, uh, where I am done so badly, but we also want to look at neighborhoods. And, and, and one of the things that I did in my Chicago project is I tried to look at neighborhoods that were demographically very similar, you know, places that looked on paper like they should have had about the same income or same outcomes during the heat wave, but in fact, did really differently. And, and we're trying to identify those kinds of cases within cities in the US right now. So can we find you know, sets of places that are demographically very similar within the same urban area, uh, but, have, but that have different outcomes? And can we try to understand you know, why that's the case? And obviously, uh, a, a contagious virus is different as a mechanism than, yeah. right? Because the heat hits you more or less uniformly the virus could have different, you know, uh, vectors in, uh, but 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 we we think there's a, a lot that we can learn from this situation, um, and hopefully we can learn things in time to. to yeah, no, I, I think, you know, I mean, and you you touched upon this a little bit, Eric. I mean, there 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 are definitely. There, there's clearly parallels, right, from from the heat wave and 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 but there are differences, right? And and you you touched upon that with with the pandemic. You know, we are supposed to stay inside, right? And um, we, we can't be going door to door like like you know you 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 talked about in in, in heat wave and and so so I guess I want to dig in a little bit deeper. I want to I want to understand what does social infrastructure look like in a time of social distancing? And I know you hate that word social distancing. So so um, but I want to I want to tease that out a bit. Um, yeah. uh, so so please. Well, first of all, if we say physical distancing, yeah. I'm very comfortable with that because that you know after all it's it's physical proximity that puts us at risk, right? Physical proximity is what creates capacity to, to spread the virus. Social connections don't have to be face-to-face, -face, um, right? So we, we don't actually need social distancing. I think we need to be looking out for each other like never before because a lot of people are very vulnerable. A lot of people are only gonna get through this. 
if we extend a helping hand. And that doesn't happen with social distancing. You know, social distancing tells us to stay inside. So social infrastructure right now, you know, I mean, so in ordinary times, you know, the models of social infrastructure that I've written a lot about include places like libraries, you know, which are great you know, physical places that are also uh, programmed, right? So you have people, these like librarians who help to bring people together and create, you know, structured activities in different spaces that accommodate a lot of people or like a, a, a playground, a park, a uh, schoolyard, even places in the private sector, obviously, like uh, diners and coffee shops. Uh, there's a lot of different kinds of social infrastructures. Right now, we need to be physically distant. So mm -hmm. the, the infrastructure we're using to engage one another is largely the screen. Mm -hmm. and, and in the book, I write about how I think that, you know, our kind of digital communication system is better seen as a communications infrastructure than a social infrastructure. I think that's you know, generally the case mm -hmm. because the truth is that things work best when they are, in ordinary times, they work best when they're supplements to our face interactions, not substitutes. Mm. Right? And, and one of the dangers we sometimes get is that too many people are substituting you know, FaceTime or Skype or you know Instagram and Facebook for actual f interactions in real life, and and I don't think that they're generally speaking as fulfilling. Now they're all we have. Like we couldn't be having this conversation with a thousand people participating, you know, was with any other technology. I'm continuing to teach my classes at NYU uh, because Zoom lets me do that. There's a lot of things that the technologies are affording us, um, but I still find them to be inadequate. And so here, as I think it's important you ask this question as we're entering into summer, because we're going to have to get out into the world, mm -hmm. even, even with physical distancing. It's, it's, we're we're going to go crazy, and we're going to get very sick when the extreme heat comes. Uh, you know, you've got you know, infants or, and toddlers. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of children uh, who are older than that, too, who are just can't be, don't want to be inside when it's 90, 100 degrees mm -hmm. uh, in urban areas. There's a lot of parents who can't, there's a lot of older people who can't. So we're going to have to find, we're going to need parks more than ever because mm -hmm. we're going to need to be out in the world but physically distant. Um, I would like to see us be able to open up beaches in a safe way. I'd like to see us be able to use, uh, you know, libraries potentially if we can find safe ways to do it. Uh, I, it we should, we're hopefully going to find a way to keep playgrounds and, and certain athletic facilities open so people can exercise at least and be active. We're, the, the next phase for us is going to be figuring out how to re-enter the social world safely. And we're going to have to do things differently than we've done before. And I think having a generous social infrastructure is going to make all the difference. If you live in a place where there's, there's not a lot of physical places, that's going to result in crowding um, and stress. Uh, and heightened danger. So here's an area again where I think places that have been made, made investments in more generous spaces that are designed well, that are maintained well, could potentially have some more success. And, and so, and I, and, and obviously, you know, that is really important. And and we're we're figuring out as it as it goes. We have a lot of practitioners, um, you know, on this in the audience that are that are that are rapidly trying to figure out how to open up, how to how to rebuild, um, and thinking that through. I do want to tease out um, before we get questions from the audience um, the idea around social solidarity because because that's going to be an important role for for our leaders and communities to really um, you know have social solidarity and to lead with social solidarity. Um, I think we could have a, a really robust conversation around social solidarity at a national level. I'm going to steer us away from that, though, um, and talk about at a local level. Um, what is what does that look like for our leaders um, yeah. um, who are managing parks, libraries? You know, how, how can they lead with social solidarity? Well, you know, look, we, we are clearly in a moment where we can see the extent to which our fates are linked to the fates of our neighbors like never before. Mm -hmm. you know? It's, it, it, if we're not respecting some basic guidelines about how to look after each other, we're in big trouble here. And that's, I think, what for me is so threatening and dangerous about people who are saying, you know, I want to be out in public without a mask, doing my regular activities no matter what, is they're not just putting themselves at risk. Mm -hmm. They're putting everyone else at, at risk. So we only get through this period if we are, if we have enough recognition of our linked faith, of our mutual interdependence, mm -hmm. um, that we can respect each other uh, and, and get and, and, and support one another's efforts to, to stay alive. And so 
we can think about solidarity at just the most basic level. You know, if I'm feeling sick, do I, you know, should I stay home or go outside? If my child's feeling sick, do I keep them home or do I, you know, do I send, they send them out? Um, we can think of it, of it at the policy level. Uh, you know, do we want to live in a society where if you skip work, uh, you're going to get fired or you won't get paid even if you're sick? So we have people working in the food industry who are showing up, you know, with a contagious virus because they, don't, you know, they need to get paid. They, you know, they don't have that kind of insurance. So there's, it, it scales up as well. Um, I think the mo the, at, at this moment, our capacity to get through this hinges on how much we decide to take each other's well-being into account. Mm. Okay, at the most fundamental level, we are being challenged to take each other's well-being into account. Right. And, you know, we see this kind of, these mantras like, you know, uh, freedom or, you know, freedom or death, you know, freedom or life, mm -hmm. uh, you know, give me liberty or give me what? Um, that, that, that's the question for how much is, how much is my personal freedom mm -hmm. worth putting at risk? Yeah. yeah. It, I want liberty at what expense? And I think we are facing a crisis in this country because mm -hmm. I think we, we're currently seeing so much self-seeking behavior uh, and, and not enough uh, behavior that is focused on the collective. And so as we head into the summer, you know, if you're running a park system or you're thinking about how to keep a neighborhood safe, you know, how do you, how do you make sure you're getting the physical distancing that you need um, while also giving people a chance to be in a public place yeah. as a park or a playground or a beach? Those are gonna be very tough questions for, for us to address. And, and I mean, that is so critical as we're thinking about opening up public spaces, that, that piece that you're highlighting. I mean, thinking about others too, because, because, because that cooperation is gonna be critical for, for the success of, the, of these phases um, that are gonna be occurring. Um, I just wanna, um, in, the, in the chat function, we've, we've put up a few links. Um, I, I do wanna link to Eric's op-ed too on social solidarity. I, I love that because it really challenged us to think about you know, what was greater than just ourselves. Um, it, it certainly um, challenged myself and my husband and, and I think that it was, it was, it was a fantastic piece. Um, so, so Lillian, I'm gonna invite you to, to hop in. Um, I know that you've been getting questions from, from the audience and um, let's elevate some of the themes that we're hearing and, and continue this conversation with Eric. Yeah, this is fascinating talk, Eric. Um, so uh, if we can, I'm gonna see if we can try and squeeze, the, squeeze in a couple of questions. So the first one, just as a starter is, can you talk a little bit about the difference between social infrastructure and social capital, if, yeah. if there's a difference? I do see a difference. So social capital, you know, as social scientists see it, is that refers to the number of connections that you have with other people. So, you know, it can be the strength of your ties or the number of your ties. Social infrastructure is like the thing that comes underneath that. It's the thing that, it's the conditions that make social capital possible. So the, the argument I make in Palaces for the People is that when you invest in social infrastructure, you know, the physical places, the public spaces, the, the libraries, the playgrounds, the parks, the athletic fields, commercial corridors that you know encourage people to come together investing in social infrastructure is what promotes social capital it's not you can't you can't really build social capital by just telling people that they should have more friends you know by just telling people to connect it doesn't work but you can change the way you design a city or a suburb or a neighborhood to encourage it and so that's what social infrastructure does so that's a perfect segue into the next set of questions. We have a couple of folks um, asking about libraries and parks. And what are your ideas for how do you actually design these spaces in a way where we can keep that physical distance? But as you know, like there, you know, a lot of the work that Knight and others um, that are listening in have really focused on is how do we design these spaces to create connection and cohesion? And so when we're six foot, six feet apart, like what does that design look like? Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, so I don't know that we're going to redesign uh, our parks and, and, and playgrounds and libraries in a durable way, you know, to get through the period, the period that we have in front of us right now. But there's a, there are things that we're going to have to do differently. The first thing we're going to have to do, so, so let me just say, we want to create beautiful places. We want to create places that are inviting and that encourage people to come and participate in face-to-face -face interactions, even if the faces are six feet apart. You know, we continue to want to do that. I know there are a lot of people who are concerned that, 
the facilities that they manage are going to be overrun, right? Like you have a you have a city and you run the parks department and you have a basketball court up. Maybe you're okay with a, a one or two people in a family being together on a court, but you don't want full on pick up basketball right now. It's too early for that. So I, I've talked to city parks commissioners about to take the hoops down to promote public health, which is not ordinarily what you want to do. But we're going to get to a point where we're going to need to have facilities open. And then I think we're going to need to do things like message better. So for instance, instead of saying to everyone, social distance, social distance, we need to say things like, you know, we need physical distance, social solidarity, and that's what gets us to a healthy city. You know, physical distance, social solidarity, healthy cities. We might need to do what New York City is starting to do now, which is let's hire a bunch of young people who would otherwise be out of work this summer and give them, you know, special shirts that, you know, are, you know that we're going to get through this shirt for the parks department and encourage them to help promote social physical distancing, right? So we don't want police officers separating people violently, but we could have some young people with a nice hat on and a visible t-shirt who are just saying, hey, Lily, uh, you know, please welcome to this park, you know, keep, keep yourself a little bit distant. So the messaging is really going to matter. And I think at some point, um, you know, some facilities will, will, it's possible we're gonna have to have limits onto the number of people who can be in there at a time. I, I don't know how that works. It's gonna be tricky. You don't wanna have long lines getting to the beach uh, or the swimming pool, but we're gonna to have to think about how to create conditions for access that make people feel safe and comfortable. Yeah, that's a great point about young people. Another one of our great public spaces fellow, Shalina Odbert, um, was giving me um, just some insights as to how the, the critical role that youth play in really sharing messages across communities um, because of, of the way that they see things happening in community and also the way that um, adults tend to receive the messages from young people. Um, so there's a couple of questions here around how do we deal with sort of the blue red divide in America, especially if you have American Americans visiting um, or traveling from areas that are in lockdown versus in these no rules areas or, or cities that are starting to open up. Um, do you have any thoughts about how we take each other into account when we have such a divisive political system? It, you know, it's, uh, this is really one of the deepest and most difficult questions we, we have in this country right now. You know, how do we build solidarity in a time when our political leadership is dividing us? Um, we have we have been polarized for some time. Um, there's you know just blatant hostility from you know one part of the country to the other part of the country, and so the you know the real question for us as a nation, I think, is what's our capacity to recognize our shared humanity uh, and our common purpose at a moment like this. You know, I've been going back to um, the Great Depression and the New Deal and listening to some of uh, FDR's fireside chats. And it's really interesting the way he talked about the appeal of his message uh, coming from this kind of basic Judeo-Christian value and the idea that, you know, I'm my brother's keeper. Um, and he felt like the message he was giving to Americans at that time was a message that we're all in it together, you know, my fellow Americans. And it's just so striking to me that we seem unable to muster that kind of rhetoric right now. And I think the absence of uh, political leadership that is encouraging us to, to seek common ground is a real danger. It's worse than that, of course. We're, you know, I think we're being you know, actively uh, uh, divided and made more hostile toward each other. And so I, I, I hope we have better leadership. Um, and, there, and we're seeing leadership, you know, we're seeing governors and mayors step up and establish local leadership that is uh, you know, really extraordinary, including in red states, by the way. It's yeah. not a blue state, red state thing, because there are a lot of people who live in red states um, where someone will say it's we need to open up, there'll be a protest movement. Um, but the overwhelming majority of, of Americans are, say, you know, we're, we'd rather stay home a little bit longer. It's dangerous because a, a small number of people can do a lot of damage right now. Um, but this whole thing only works if we learn to take care of each other. Yeah, it's, it's dangerous to fall into that division between blue and red. And it is, you're totally right. I mean, for us, uh, one of our 26 communities includes Akron, Ohio, and I've had great conversations with the local leadership there and the governor there is doing an amazing job. So it really doesn't have to be that distinction. Um, all right, just one quick question. I'll turn it over to Lily to close, close us out. Um, there is 
if we are to stay connected in this virtual world while we're all staying indoors, um, what do you think about the digital divide? There's a question um, on the Q&A about whether you think um, the internet should be considered a utility. D does your work delve into that or what are, what are your thoughts it there? very much does. In fact, I wrote a book, my, my work with the Knight Foundation uh, started years ago because I wrote a book called Fighting for Air about the state of our nation's media system. And uh, I continue to believe that the internet must be a utility. Uh, you know, you can't like think of all the families uh, who, whose children are trying to do remote education right now. You can't do remote education if you can't get online. Um, obviously issues about who has access to a laptop or a tablet, but there's even more fundamental issues about who has access to the internet. And especially now we're entering into a moment where, uh, you know, getting access to education, doing the census, uh, potentially voting this year, uh, you know, is going to registering to more and more of our activities, uh, cultural, civic, political, social, require an internet connection. And if we don't have the internet as a utility that's accessible for everyone, we are systematically excluding all of those people uh, from our public life and our civic life. And so I think now is, there's a lot of things that we're able to see more clearly because of this crisis. And a lot of my research has been about all the things that generally we can see more clearly uh, during crises. And this crisis has clearly highlighted our nation's glaring need for a better internet policy. Yeah. Thanks, Eric. Lily, you wanna take it away? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Lillian. Um, so, so Eric, I, I loved what you said. You said physical distance, social solidarity, healthier cities. That's what we're going to be thinking. That's what practitioners can be thinking about, you know, as we're transitioning. Physical distance, social solidarity, healthier cities. Um, and and with that, I just I have a I, I have to ask a final question to you yeah. um, because um, because we have we have many practitioners that are dealing with serious budget cuts literally as we speak um, with libraries and parks and yeah. and um, and so any advice that you can give um, as as our cities are navigating these these cuts I mean you know I, I, I'm a social scientist and I've never had the challenge of having to uh, run a park system on a declining budget so I don't know if I'm the right person to give advice about how to do that right, but I do think it's time for all of us who are advocates and believers in public spaces mm -hmm. to do a better job of telling the story of why it's important for us to bail our, our institutions out too. I mean, we there's no idea, you can't have an economic stimulus plan that, that isn't affecting our social life. And we, we're, you know, we're not just having an economic recession, we're also experiencing a social recession, a very painful one. And we are going to need to make a massive investment in our social infrastructure to get through this. And so, I, I, you know, it's time for us at the policy level to think about, you know, not cutting the budget for parks and public spaces and libraries and athletic fields, but doing what they wound up doing in the New Deal, which is making a dramatic uh, expansion uh, in programming in all of those areas. So. I think the way we get through this is uh, by making the bailout bill more expansive and making sure that you know people who are trying to build physical places uh, that will allow Americans to stay healthy this summer have the resources they need. That's something we're only gonna get if we as a community, I'm talking about the people who are on this Zoom chat right mm -hmm. now, find a way to make that point and to raise our voices and to demand uh, that there's a bailout for public spaces that we revive public life and civic life, that, that our, our well-being depends on it. Because if we don't advocate for ourselves, uh, no one's gonna hand out that money for us. I guarantee you everybody on this call who's managing a system is facing budget cuts at the very time when we need this system to work more than ever. Yeah. It's essential. Thank, that was beautiful. Thank you. Um, take a second, though, to to tell us um, about the shift and and it's launching tonight at 5 p.m. Um, we also we circulated the link and the and the chat function. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for doing that. So uh, at NYU, I, I run a, an institute called the Institute for Public Knowledge. We do a lot of programming and research, you know, that, on issues that affect all of our well-being. We have partnered with the Knight Foundation with Civic Signals, with the Social Science Research Council. And we're starting tonight at 5 p.m., we're gonna run a series of uh, panels uh, that bring together people who are trying to make sense of the shift from 
our physical face-to-face mm-hmm. -face world to our face-to-screen world. Here we are together. Uh, and we're going to try to understand it and all of its implications. We're going to talk tonight about public space, but future conversations we, will be about things like work and democracy, uh, e equality and inequality around access. Uh, so please join us. Um, hopefully you're, you've circulated the link. Um, yeah. Really excited about this initiative and about our partnership. So hopefully this 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 wet everyone's appetite for to to learn a bit more about this and to and to go in deeper for public spaces. Um, thank you so much, Eric, uh, for joining us. Um, I also. I also want to flag that um, every Tuesday we are doing this and um, at 1 p.m. Um, and the next episode is on equity and public space. What inequities is the current crisis amplifying and how can we address that in the recovery? Um, we will be circulating RSVP for, RSVP for that and um, we're excited to, to go into that topic next week uh, at 1 p.m. Same time, same place. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Lily. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.